How do you make the entertainment capital of the world more exciting? Well, you build an F1 track right through it. Formula One is heading to Las Vegas for the first ever ta- uh, Oh wait, actually, they raced around Caesars Palace car park in 1981 and 1982. But I mean, look at it. Let's forget about that for this video. Formula One is heading to Las Vegas in 2023 in its second attempt at making Sin City a mainstay in the yearly calendar. But this time, the cars will be racing straight through the boulevard. The new and improved layout has 17 corners and has one of the longest straights in Formula One, nearly 1.2 miles. Drivers are expected to reach top speeds of 212 miles per hour and will pass through iconic mainstays such as Caesars Palace, the Fountains of Bellagio, the Mini Eiffel Tower and the brand new Sphere, which, by the way, the F1 will have control of during the race. Sounds amazing, right? Well, not quite. As you can imagine, to make the bustling streets of one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world safe for 20 giant boxes of carbon fiber weighing nearly a ton each to fly around the city for nearly two hours requires a lot of infrastructure, and that has sparked outrage amongst Vegas residents. But before we talk about the complaints from the huge disruption Formula One has caused, we need to discuss how they managed to build the enormous paddock building, laying the tarmac, all the fencing, temporary bridges and so much more, all without shutting down the city. And make sure to stick around to the end of the video because I've asked Max Verstappen's old performance engineer what we should expect from the track. And it seems that Formula One have already made a pretty costly mistake. Formula One announced in March 2022 that they would be hosting a Las Vegas Grand Prix from 2023 for 10 years. But this is different to every other race. Usually, an independent organiser pays F1 millions of dollars to be able to host. But this time, Formula One are fronting the cost themselves. So you best believe they need it to succeed. Especially when the latest estimates are putting it at a cost of $500 million for this first year. The last thing they want to do is create a boring race, which, as I mentioned earlier, happened in 1982, when they basically raced around a car park. So that's why their goal was to build a track which goes past all of Vegas' landmarks. But this creates a big dilemma. The more of the strip you incorporate, the cooler the spectacle of the race will be, but the logistics of hosting become much harder. The project manager, Terry Miller, who has experienced building sports stadiums, said, The order of magnitude of this project is significantly beyond what NFL stadiums or NBL stadiums are. Some NFL stadiums take 36 to 48 months to build in an empty parking lot with little disruption. The Vegas construction team didn't have this luxury. They had a little over a year to build a huge paddock building, relay the roads, create hospitality venues, install the fencing, add track lighting and build grandstands, all whilst not closing the roads or access to the thousands of entertainment venues. So let's break down how they did it, starting with the pit building. Liberty Media, who own Formula One, commissioned a 300,000 square foot pit building on a 37 acre plot of land on the corner of Harmon Avenue and Coval Lane. The land which is built on cost them a whopping $240 million. Unfortunately for them, the site had about a 25 foot drop from one corner to the other, so they had to fill it in with 18 feet of earth. Despite this setback, they managed to build the structure in a little under a year. At peak time, there were over 500 workers alternating shifts to work 20-hour days. On race weekend, the bottom floor will be occupied by the teams and the FIA. There are 13 garages with three bays each. The second and third floors will host multiple luxury hospitality areas, including one on the terrace. And if you want to be part of the paddock club, you can pick up a ticket for just $15,000. And of course, to finish it with a touch of Vegas, just behind the building, they have the world's first F1 chapel. So yes, you can actually get married there. For the rest of the year, the building will become F1's new worldwide headquarters and will host different events and exhibitions. Oh, and I forgot to mention the ginormous LED F1 logo on the roof. As you can imagine, F1 tracks are not made of the same asphalt that you would find in front of your local shop. It's much denser and significantly smoother, so none of the existing roads were suitable for the race. And in fact, having existing roads only made the job harder. 
they have to rip out anywhere from 4 to 10 inches and then repave it. And as I just mentioned, it has to be extremely smooth, so one of the most important moments of laying it is the joint at wider parts. Even a very small ridge could lead to a huge accident. Free practice one ended just 10 minutes in due to an exposed manhole wiping out Carlos Sainz and Esteban Ocon's cars. Luckily, nobody was injured, but they had to check the rest of the track. Not the start they were hoping for in Vegas. Whilst carrying out these works, they had to ensure all tourists, residents and employees still had access to where they needed to be. They tried to do most of the paving work in the mornings when Vegas is quieter, but with tight deadlines, this wasn't always possible. In true Las Vegas style, they painted the curbs around the track to resemble a pack of cards. And on the outside of the track, they had to install the concrete barriers and a 12-foot debris catch fence, of which they actually borrowed half of them from the Miami track. There is, however, one huge problem with the track, which will be answered by Max Verstappen's old performance engineer Blake later in this video. As it's a night race and is kicking off at 10pm local time, a lot of lighting is needed around the perimeter of the 6.2 km track. The actual amount of lighting is quite mind-blowing. There are 1,600 floodlights, 8.2 km of metal truss to support the lighting, and 32 km of cabling. All of this was ordered brand new for the race, but it was the same team who installed Singapore's lighting rig who did this. I've mentioned this already, but one of the key goals when constructing the Las Vegas F1 track was to allow the busy streets to continue operating. But when you run a track through a city, this becomes pretty hard. So what did they do? We don't have a lot of overpasses in the resort corridor that allow traffic to move freely over the main circuit area. So we have to build the overpasses. They built four 760 foot long two lane bridges. They're supposed to be as sturdy as those you might drive over on a highway, but they are temporary. This created yet another challenge. The bridge footings have to be specifically constructed to support the weight of the traffic, but not leave holes in the road when they're dismantled. Despite most of Vegas being a visual eyesore due to all the building work, many of the casinos are connected by trams and elevated walkways, so the access for tourists wasn't actually that bad. These walkways have screens in place so you can't see the race from there, and then they've installed barriers around them so you can't rip the screen off. There will, however, be times where movement around Vegas will be pretty closed. Each day of the event, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, roads begin soft closures at 5pm, and will be fully closed by 7pm. They won't begin reopening until 2am. This is just an unavoidable part of having a street race that happens elsewhere, such as in Monaco. There are four main complaints with the Las Vegas Grand Prix. The disruption, the race time, the ticket prices and the track itself. Everything discussed in this video has obviously caused disruption and it would be an understatement to say residents are fuming. Traffic on Las Vegas Boulevard has been reduced to a slow crawl and pedestrians are being funneled along narrow walkways. One resident even said, life as I knew it ended when the construction started. F1's response to this is that it's expected to bring $1.7 billion of revenue to Vegas, so it should be the very definition of short-term pain and long-term gain. Whilst the construction works have been a pain to Vegas residents, it has been made worse by the fact the $2.3 billion sphere was also being constructed at the same time. It only recently opened on September the 29th. As some of the big infrastructure is now in place, it should be a lot more streamlined from 2024 onwards. The second main complaint is the race time. Obviously, they want as many people watching as possible, so they decided that the best start time was 10pm local. This means the race will start at 6am in the UK, 7am in mainland Europe, and 5pm in Australia, but 1am for Americans on the East Coast. To make matters worse, qualifying will be at 3am East Coast time. So Vegas is a home GP where 48% of the country will have to stay awake till nearly 4am just to watch qualifying. The third complaint is one of the biggest for F1 fans, and that's the ticket prices. The cheapest tickets available were standing only in West Harmon, which were $500 per person, but sold out instantly. To actually sit down, the cheapest was $1,500 per person, but again, sold out instantly. The one redeeming factor is that the Las Vegas Grand Prix is the only in the world to offer complimentary food and drink. 
Usually, this is just reserved for hospitality packages, but I suppose that's the least they can do. However, the cost doesn't stop there. Fans also need a place to stay, and as you can imagine, hotel prices rocketed. But let's just imagine for a second you have an unlimited budget. What is the most expensive ticket you could buy? That would be $5 million. That gets you five nights in the free bed Nobu Sky Villa at Caesars Palace, plus 12 paddock tickets and a bunch of other VIP extras. The villa sits right above the racetrack on the strip with a terrace for 75 people. Evidently, the Vegas Grand Prix isn't accessible to the average F1 fan, but also I'm not really sure Liberty Media are too concerned with this, especially for the first year. And finally, the fourth biggest complaint is about the racing itself. The layout doesn't look like it's going to promote much intense on-track action, but there's a bigger issue. I'll pass this one on to Break F1, who used to be Max Verstappen's performance engineer, to explain. Because the race is at night, the track temperature will be closer to the ambient temperature. And it's November in Las Vegas. The ambient temperature could be down as low as 5 degrees Celsius. Formula 1 tires don't really generate a whole lot of grip when they're cold. Also, considering the tarmac is brand new, the grip will be even lower than normal. And to compound that, there aren't any support races other than Formula 1 on the track this weekend. So that's going to be a really low grip track for most of the weekend. I expect most of the overtakes to be at the end of the long, nearly two kilometers straight down the Las Vegas Strip into turn 12. I think this is going to be a very unpredictable and exciting race. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the technical side of Formula One, once you've got to the end of this video, check out the link in the description below for my YouTube page. So yeah, clearly the track temperatures could be an issue. Despite the contentious disruption, there is no denying that transforming the neon-lit cityscape into a high-stakes racetrack will be a great viewing spectacle. Formula One's huge bet on the Las Vegas Grand Prix may prove that in the world of racing, controversy can amplify the excitement. Even if the race itself won't go down in history books, the event certainly will.